course, my name is Chris Harwood. I am president of the New York chapter of SVU, the Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences. And uh, as my day job, I'm teaching Czech at Columbia University. And uh, uh, it's a, a really exciting program uh, for us. Uh, we're, we're glad to have a, a speaker who uh, is, has often been in New York uh, and um, is going to tell us a, a really uh, compelling New York story today. Uh, but before I introduce him, I uh, uh, would like to just make a couple of general announcements. We would love to get your feedback uh, on today's programming or on previous programming. So send us a note to New York at svu2000.org. Um, and we would like to say thank you, as always, uh, to our, our leading sponsor, the Bohemian Benevolent and Literary Association, who makes all of our programming possible. Please come also check us out. Uh, uh, on our website and on Facebook, and also on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, which enough of you have subscribed to that you can find it uh, uh, with our name on it now. We have a named YouTube channel, and we have a lot of our prior programming uh, posted there, and we, we hope to keep uploading more, uh, more programming there. So check that out. Uh, and I would also like to invite you to our next program coming up in uh, uh, just a couple of weeks. It will be an in-person presentation, our first in-person program in some time in the Bohemian National Hall. We were, we're going to also look into uh, being able to live stream this if we can, but uh, we don't have that quite set up. Uh, but if you are able to come to the Bohemian National Hall on Thursday, September 30th, 7 p.m., please do so, please RSVP. Uh, to this event, um, and we'll be having a presentation uh, by Martin Holub, uh, an architect uh, who probably many of you who, who follow us in New York have met at our events, uh, a very uh, 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 charming and interesting person who's going to uh, uh, share his two volumes of sort of memoirs with us, and it promises to be an interesting, a very interesting, entertaining event. Martin uh, wanted to hold out for uh, a, an in-person version. He, we've had this event in the works for a while, but uh, he wanted to do this live rather than just uh, online. So please join us for that. So uh, let me now uh, introduce our, our featured speaker for today, Yuji Bognik, um, who was born in Plzen in then Czechoslovakia. And he emigrated from communist Czechoslovakia in 1987, uh, just after his 17th birthday, along with his mother and 10 year old sister. Uh, after some peregrinations, they made it to the United States in 1989. Uh, Yuzhi began his higher education as an art student at the Munson Williams Proctor School of Art in Utica, New York. And he then transferred to the Cooper Union here in New York City, uh, where he received his degree in architecture. Uh, he then worked as a structural engineer and an architect on many New York high-rise buildings, including the NYU Palladium and the Federal Courthouse in Brooklyn. Uh, since then, uh, Yuzi has worked as an architect specializing in high-rise residential buildings uh, in Manhattan. Recently, he wrote, relocated back to his hometown of Pilsen, Czech Republic, uh, where he works as an architect and a designer for Czech and American clients. Uh, and he continues to keep close ties uh, with New York, his, his second home. And uh, uh, Yuzi is going to be talking, of course, about... Uh, uh, 9-11 uh, story today, but he's also the author of a couple of volumes um, uh, in Czech, uh, uh, these two books that came out, uh, uh, the first one, Česká ženě bez hranic, Czech Women Without Borders, um, uh, and then in 2017, Čeští muži bez hranic, Czech Men Without Borders, and both of these books uh, feature profiles of prominent uh, Czech-born people who only reached really their full potential uh, uh, after emigrating. So uh, th these are uh, fascinating stories, uh, many of them intersecting with uh, people connected to us uh, here in New York. So uh, check those out. And uh, today he's going to be presenting on uh, this book, Towers, a 9-11 story, which I know has an interesting uh, kind of genesis. And so I'm going to uh, close my screen and welcome Yuzhi and invite him to tell us more. Thanks for joining us, Yuzhi. Thank you, Chris. It was a wonderful introduction. Uh, it's such a good feeling to be in New York, even though I'm not there physically, but at least, you know, through this digital media, I'm there and it, it still feels like home. 
Um, okay, so thanks for the introduction. I will go very, let's say, expediently quickly through some of the slides that I've prepared and through the story of those days. And then we can, in the second, let's say half, we can focus on some questions, answers, or go into some of the, uh, uh, into some of the themes more in detail. So I will now share my screen with you. So um, New York, I came to New York in 1989. Um, uh, this was a, a wonderful time. It was, uh, you know, the, the economy was doing well. Um, I was actually uh, studying art uh, at, in a school upstate New York, but I always loved New York ever since I saw Crocodile Dundee or uh, Ghostbusters, uh, you know, any of these movies, um, French Connection, uh, New York was holding a very special place in my heart. And I very much longed to, to join that city and become one of its citizens. Uh, so after um, transferring to Cooper Union, which is a school in Manhattan, I graduated, graduated in 97. Uh, I joined a structural engineering firm, Cantor Sainik. This was one of my professors, um, teachers. Uh, he was teaching, um, sorry, got it. He was teaching uh, structural engineering. And uh, he said, you know, you're graduating, don't go to master's class, you know, it's a waste of time. The economy is doing well. So, um, so I started working on uh, uh, large construction projects, tall buildings uh, in Manhattan. This is um, Battery Park City. Uh, it was 41. Uh, 41 uh, battery battery place, I believe. And it was uh, it was a project of my professor. It was um, actually by coincidence, 41 stories high. And uh, what I enjoyed was being always on top of the building and um, you know, seeing the seagulls above me. Uh, it was an incredible feeling. Uh, this led to uh, several other projects. I then left Cantrosenic and started working for a construction uh, company uh, and started working on a construction of, um, of courthouse in downtown Manhattan. It was a federal building uh, on Cadman Plaza. So this was in summer of 2001. One important thing uh, connected with this project is that we were issued um, uh, the GSA ID cards, which was actually very useful uh, in on 9-11 and in the following days. It's because uh, it allowed us to enter our ground zero. September 11, it was, um, as many of you who live in New York uh, remember, uh, it was a beautiful day, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, perfect temperature, perfect humidity, and um, it was Tuesday. Uh, it was um, one day after Monday Night Football. It was the day when New Yorkers went to the polls and they were casting their votes for either Bloomberg or Green. And uh, also it was the first day of school for many of the kids, uh, which actually was very a uh, fortunate situation because uh, the World Trade Center towers were not completely filled up. Uh, many people slept over or they came to work later. And uh, that was one of the actually lucky uh, coincidences on that day. Uh, this was a, uh, the, um, it's called um, construction meeting. It happened once a day, I'm, I'm sorry, once a week on Tuesday usually. And this preceded our, um, our meeting. You know, if we were arguing with the subcontractors, they were trying to negotiate always extra few more days or a few more dollars. And it wasn't always pleasant, but it was just a very regular day. And if I go back to it, that morning around 9 a.m., uh, my phone rang. We were sitting in a, uh, in, in a big room you know, with, with a plywood table. 
and everybody was doodling on the table or playing with their stirs in their plastic coffee cups. The coffee was very shitty and there was no Starbucks at that time. And uh, we were trying to get out of the subcontractors some very real and, uh, and binding deadlines. All of a sudden my phone rang and a friend of mine called me and she said, Yershi, there's a plane that flew in to one of the towers. It must have been, you know, some Cessna, small plane. He had a heart attack. You know, it's terrible. I told her, I'm going to call you back and went back to the meeting. In about 10, 15 minutes, all our pagers and, uh, and phones started ringing, buzzing, and the whole table started vibrating. It was very interesting all of a sudden. And then a few minutes later, the, the door busted open and the superintendent of the building, uh, Mike, he started yelling at us and he says, everybody out. It's, it's, a, it's an attack on America. I just saw a second plane fly into the second tower. And this is a federal building. We have to evacuate now. So we bolted for the stairwell. And when we got out on, on the uh, Kenman Plaza in front of the uh, courthouse, we saw the towers burning. And we huddled around a car that had windows pulled down and uh, radio blasting and we tried to get a hold of what's going on uh, to to make sense you know is that attack on uh, all of the united states or new york or how many buildings or who is this and uh, there was a, there was there were news that about eight planes were still up in the in the air and uh, they're going to attack bridges tunnels i had some friends who i uh visited at the North Tower. It was landmark education, self-improvement, self-help uh, kind of uh, organization. I was taking some courses there that summer and uh, I was calling them, couldn't get through. And I recall 1993, because in 1993, the first attack uh, at the WTC happened. That's when some, uh, some guy, terrorist guy, uh, had, a, had some detonation in the subterranean, subterranean parking lot. And I was dating a girl, this beautiful um, Puerto Rican girl who was working on the 100th floor of the North Tower. And she was calling me in the studio, in the architecture studio. And she says, it's, it's very confusing. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. We're, we should evacuate, but I'm on the 100th floor and I have to walk down the stairs it's dark in the staircase and, and smoke, there's smoke. And I told her, you know, go all the way down and get out uh, to the north side of the plaza and I'll meet you there. So I went to meet her and I remember seeing the fire trucks and ambulances and, and even helicopter landing on, uh, west, uh, on West Street. And basically they parked right underneath the North Tower. So now in 2001, when I'm standing next to the Brooklyn Bridge and I see all the fire trucks and ambulances heading over Brooklyn Bridge to Manhattan, I realize that they're gonna do exactly the same. They're gonna park right under the towers. And I wasn't somehow knowledgeable or I didn't know that the towers were gonna to collapse completely, but I knew that something was gonna fall down. Some part, you know, some, skin, whatever the, you know, uh, whatever was above the impact uh, area of the North Tower and the South Tower is going to fall down. So uh, I, had, I had a choice either to stay and watch or to go and warn them. So I grabbed my hard hat and uh, flashlight put over radio and I went over Brooklyn Bridge against thousands of people evacuating Manhattan. And when I was about halfway uh, in the middle of the bridge, uh, the, south, the South Tower started collapsing. And I remember it was, um, it was completely quiet. Nobody was making a sound. And all of a sudden this tower is just disappearing, you know, in three, four seconds. And then it was just cloud dust. And then after those three, four seconds, this rumble reached us. 
And I didn't even have a chance to yell, look, look back, you know, the tower is falling. And, um, and when people heard the, the rumble, they turned back and saw actually there's only one tower. No, you know, two are two towers. There's no more twins. There's only one. And so panic uh, ensued. And, you know, people were losing, um, women were losing shoes and they started running. And I got scared at that, at that time too, because I heard that other planes were up in the air and I saw some above my head and um, they were saying that bridges were going to be targeted. So I, I get scared for the first time and I turned back towards Brooklyn. But then when I realized those were our F-16s, I went back to Manhattan again. When I reached the city hall, uh, the North Tower started collapsing. And um, I remember this incredible speed at which the, this plume of smoke and, and, and dust was enveloping the whole square in front of uh, city hall. And you couldn't see like, you know, three feet in front of your face. And I knew that it was over. Both towers were gone. And um, I saw some blinking lights, you know, through the dust, you could discern some flash, flashing lights of the police car. So I went towards them, but there were barricades. So where they said, you know, you can't go any further. You gotta stop here. So uh, I went home and uh, was watching everything uh, on TV, and I thought, okay, I should join the Marines or police force or something. I, something I got to do. The next day, when I woke up, uh, I went back to work, but it was crazy the idea of going to work. So um, I um, basically I talked to some of my uh, colleagues, and uh, we decided to. A joint, join a team or make a team and go and look for survivors and sort out the, the debris and you know move the rubble because we saw on TV that there were a lot of uh, volunteers doing that. So uh, I convinced uh, the police people, the police at the uh, Brooklyn Bridge regarding the entrance. Nobody could actually go from Brooklyn to Manhattan. And I said, you know, we have to go in please, you know, take us there. So they loaded us up in a truck and took us over the bridge to uh, uh, WTC. And I remember seeing beautiful sunny day entering the Battery Park Tunnel. And once we actually exited the tunnel, it was a moonscape. It was, you know, it was a different light. It was dark and Everywhere was like one foot of water and mud because the firemen were hosing down the, uh, the um, they were hosing down everything around the towers, all the fires. So this was uh, a photo from the next day, next morning. Some of the trucks and uh, destroyed vehicles were already moved away. Uh, here you can see the mud. It was uh, really somewhere close to a foot uh, and um, it was hard to actually make your way through. And this was the sight or the view I had when I was uh, exiting Albany and getting to West Street. Uh, you could see that, you know, further down, there is almost zero visibility. The guys who were on top of that mound, uh, they could see really only a few feet ahead of them. So uh, this was the situation the next morning. Some of the cranes were already on site, but only few because they couldn't really get to the epicenter. So they were sitting at a maximum, you know, on, right on West Street. I joined a bucket brigade. And um, after several hours, I realized that firemen and rescue workers and construction workers uh, did not know really what they were searching for. I mean, we were hoping that thousands of people were buried under, under, the, ta uh, under the rubble, but we didn't know where. And I thought uh, if anybody survived, they would have been not within the footprints of the towers, but in the outside areas, you know, where some air pockets could have been formed by you know, debris locking into itself and for each other. 
or the stairwells or elevator shafts. So I said, okay, do we have some set of plans to, to locate these stairwells? And there were none. So I started looking that morning for a set of plans. After, you know, maybe it was already noon, I found a set of plans at the mobile command post of the PAPD. And it was the only set because everything else was buried. Uh, the Twin Towers World Trade Center did not fall under jurisdiction of building department. Normally, you would find any drawings in the building department. They had them on files. But it was different for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. So uh, it was very, it was luck to find a set of plans. I was actually concerned with the subterranean levels because it was, you know, it was not, at this point, it was pointless to, uh, to have anything above ground because it just got completely mashed. And they didn't want to give me the, the plan. So uh, they sent a police officer, William Burns, with me. And I went to the uh, Turner Construction. And they had offices somewhere around uh, 14th Street and, or, or Canal Street. I, I don't remember anymore. But they had power. So uh, made, I made seven copies, distributed them to uh, FDNY, CIA, FBI, you know, all, this, all the uh, units that were there on site. And I kept one for myself. With that said, I started looking with a group of firemen and we were looking for, uh, you know, for elevator shafts and stairwells. Here you can see actually how it looked like once you entered the actual site. You couldn't see really anything. And it was it was difficult because you could tr you had to tread very carefully. You didn't know if you were stepping on something that is solid or, you know, or if you were even stepping on some body, uh, which happened quite often. This is uh, the tower one, the North Tower. You can see on the left on, on the right, uh, the uh, exterior wall still standing. So these are photos from the first day. Um, uh, after a few days, I actually, my work was more, let's say, organized or focused. I started working with the building department people and we were checking surrounding buildings for any collateral damage to make sure that there would be no secondary uh, uh, destruction or collapse, uh, which, would, which would endanger the construction workers that were over there. You can see that everything was very monochromatic. You know, there's a green jacket on the bottom of that picture. But other than that, everything was just this light gray color. This was a moment when we actually located uh, one of the elevator shafts and uh, some firemen, these were from Brooklyn Squad 252. They descended, uh, they with a torch, they cut the, uh, the ceiling of the car, elevator car. And um, there was like 14 people, they were all dead. Here you can see the, the firemen descending into the elevator shaft. Uh, once in a while, I don't know if it was every hour, uh, but it was at some intervals and uh, we everything stopped, all the machinery stopped and we were listening for survivors. We were really hoping that there would be hundreds or thousands of them. And the worst feeling was actually that we didn't hear anything, no banging, nothing. Uh, a friend of mine, Tuna Cassidy, he was a fireman who actually hurt his back. And so he wasn't in the first line of uh, guys responding to the, the call. Uh, he saved 13 people on September 11th. This is a picture of the command post center. It was a impromptu uh, a, a, you know, center with, for all the units are responding to the event and uh, it was at the 
Chamber Street School, I think IS-89, I think it was called. This was an interesting moment. Uh, that's the World Financial Center building. Uh, it was called American Express. It's still probably called that way. And it was on the other side, on the west side of West Street. And when the North Tower was collapsing, some of the columns got wedged into the face of this building. And this column was uh, stuck at, I think, 26th floor. Uh, no, sorry, 17th floor. And uh, Amec, there was, there was a construction building, I'm um, sorry, construction company that was responsible for clearing the west side of the site, WTC site. Uh, the workers were afraid um, when they had to remove the south pedestrian bridge. There were two pedestrian bridges uh, spanning over West Street uh, between World Trade Center and World Financial Center on each side of the uh, of the Winter Garden. So in order for them to work and keep removing the North Bridge so that trains and equipment and cars can get closer to the epicenter, uh, this had to be somehow either removed or secured. So I climbed up to that floor. This was a view I had. Uh, I recognized that this was really the, the floor damaged because you could see that the orthogonal uh, lines were in that corner, in that southeast corner, were turning into some rhomboid shapes. And when I opened the door to Lawrence Marsh office, he had a corner office. I see some, I hear some sound, okay, good. Uh, uh, you could see uh, completely the entire side because that column uh, destroyed corner of that, uh, of that building. So we had to secure that, uh, that column. It, this wasn't done by me. It was done by firemen the night before. But uh, I, I told them that they had, they had to go up with a torch uh, or, or welding, uh, with a welding torch and actually secure, uh, weld the column to the structure of the Amex building because these ropes are not going to hold anything. This is a desk of Florence Marsh. You can see family photos. And only three feet to the left, uh, you had this big hole in, in the side of the building. This was a photo I took from that floor. You could see how the exterior walls of the towers unfolded like this grate or, or banana peel. Um, and then maybe you can discern little figures there. Those are firemen making the bucket lines, bucket, bucket brigade lines. Uh, this was the view from Amex building of the winter, uh, winter garden, which was restored since then and functions now. Uh, this is between building five and six. Those were the lower six story structures, or maybe 10 story structures. Uh, that were surrounding the uh, Twin Towers. That's the exterior wall of the North Tower between the two buildings. Uh, here's, uh, let's say, a week later. That's what it looked like. It was already after rain. It rained on Thursday the 14th, I think, uh, when President Bush came to visit and talk from, from the pile with his, uh, with his loudspeaker. And uh, so after that, it was uh, a little easier to actually make one's way through the rubble because you could tell what, you know, not everything was the solid, complete monochrome color. Uh, here's a picture. Is this, sorry, is this a ghost? It was on uh, October 31st, uh, Halloween. <clears throat> I took a picture, it was maybe 6 p.m. And I saw on top of this one elevator shaft, a figure. It was a figure of a fireman, but it was weird that nobody was supposed to be there. Uh, there was a dangerous area. Some fires were still springing up there. And uh, so I wasn't sure when I was taking this picture whether it was a real person. 
uh, many of us, we believe that we actually did see ghosts on doing our work there on site. This was one of the lighter moments when uh, I was inside the Millennium, Millennium Hilton Hotel, uh, right on uh, Church Street. In the lobby, there was a piano. And uh, <clears throat> so I have to admit that it wasn't all just sad and, and gruesome and, and terrible, that there were moments when we actually were just human and uh, allowed some, uh, some humor. Otherwise, I guess we couldn't really do it. Here again, view from the Amex building. When I took the photos, I did this collage, which helped to produce uh, some of the first 3D models that uh, uh, I built there with some help with students of Cooper Union and, and other colleagues. These are destroyed vehicles that were uh, hauled to Staten Island uh, dump. I call it Kill Hill. FBI looking, this was the last check. The, the debris got sorted and, and checked many times. And this was the final, you know, before it would be moved and covered with, uh, with uh, soil. And this is what I found on top of, uh, in October, I found that on top of the Deutsche Bank. Uh, if anybody wanted to say that, you know, flight AA-11 didn't uh, fly into the North Tower, this is uh, a clear argument against that because I found uh, headphones from a uh, American Airlines flight and parts of the plane and buckle, etc. Somebody was going to Wall Trade Center and I guess luckily didn't make it there. We found this uh, train, it was a path train in December. Uh, that's when all the debris was cleared all the way to the bottom to the B6 level. Luckily, nobody was on a train. Uh, all the people were able to evacuate before the towers collapsed. Uh, this I'm showing because the, in the following picture, here's a close up. You can actually see a lady standing right in the center of that, uh, of that picture. And it's amazing that actually somebody survived the impact of that plane. I'm sure she didn't survive the fall of the building because nobody from that floor saved themselves. This is about 91st floor of the North Tower. And um, based on these photographs we did later, because we worked with the engineers studying the collapse or NIST report, studying the collapse of the towers and what caused it, uh, it led to these um, sketches, which led then to a computer model. Um, it was a Maya program computer model, which allowed also animation. And that way we could actually animate the progressive collapse of the towers. This is the north, uh, I'm sorry, this is the second tower that was hit. So that's the south face of the south tower. That's the Boeing 767. Uh, what the engineer from Leslie Robertson, I'm, I'm sorry, Leslie Robertson, the engineer that designed the towers, what he counted with was uh, this type of plane. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't count the gasoline that was inside the wings of the, uh, of the plane. He said, I calculated the impact load or the kinetic force of the plane going at certain speed and the towers would withstand it. They did, they even withstood the larger plane, uh, but he didn't take into account the gas that was in the plane's wings. And that's what brought the buildings down. Here you can see for comparison, the size of the tower, I think it's the North Tower, I believe, and the size of the plane. 
Uh, the plane basically uh, compromised the exterior skin. It was a load-bearing scale, a skin, but the building st still stood, right? And if there was no gasoline, it would still today, it was it would stand. You know, because it's it's a square frame. Even if you had a C-shape or U-shaped building, you know, it would uh, it would not collapse. But the problem was the gas. Uh, here is a picture of uh, the computer model. It's a screen, screenshot, which we developed after uh, several, uh, let's say, weeks. Uh, and the computer model helped to explain to some of the construction workers and firemen that some areas were not safe to uh, work uh, or walk through because something could fall on them. So. Uh, a series of models that uh, I developed at Ground Zero helped in um, in the safety and and guiding the some of the work done there. This is a picture of a plexiglass model that we built in October and on November second we delivered it to Ground Zero to the command post. These are students of Cooper Union. I approached them in October saying, "Look, it would be great if we could make a build a model." very precise model uh, of the subter subterranean levels where each column would be shown. If the column is compromised or if it's destroyed, we would show it there. And uh, this model took about uh, maybe two weeks to construct. Most of the work were, was done by the students, which was amazing. And uh, that's my alma mater, Cuprionian. So I was very happy that they uh, took it up as a, as a challenge and uh, did a great job. That's a picture from the top. And then I think here we are at the end. Uh, this is the tribute in light. Uh, it was a, it was a, let's say, idea or project developed by Cooper Union classmate also. He was from the art school, a friend, Julian Lavardier. And uh, on 11th of March, 2002, uh, these beams were uh, marking the half year anniversary of September 11. And the last slide is, um, this is a picture of my design for the World Trade Center Memorial. Uh, I did it before the actual winning design was submitted. Um, I sent it to some friends via email, so there's a record actually. This was my design not after seeing the winning uh, design, but you see some similarities. What I try to do is to restore back the uh, original uh, water or coastline of the island of Manhattan. And uh, within the bathtub, which is kind of a you know play on words, in the bathtub, I put back the water, which was, Man uh, which was Hudson River, connected through some tube to the actual Hudson River, and the water would fall and wash down the walls, four walls, on whose face would be chiseled the names of the dead. And that way their names would be perpetually washed by ebb and flow of Hudson River because it rises and it you know, recedes. And that's the end of the presentation. Okay. Thank you so much, Yuzi, for, for sharing that. Um, maybe um, uh, before we open up uh, the floor to conversation, I was wondering, you know, this is, uh, of course, this is your story, um, uh, but it is also a book presentation. I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about the history of this book project, because I know it had an interesting evolution. Uh -huh. Well, uh, when we were working at Ground Zero, uh, we did not consider anything, you know, whether we had to sleep or eat, uh, the adrenaline was so pumping through our veins that uh, uh, those were secondary concerns. You know, there was no really fear or anything. And after six months, this was in March, especially around the uh, tribute and light moment. Uh, I remember actually having for the first time some, uh, well, some signs of PTSD 
And so uh, I actually wanted to, you know, step into the tracks of, you know, incoming train at, uh, at Bedford Street in Brooklyn on the L train. And I realized I needed help. So I uh, sought help of Project Liberty psychologists. This was a free uh, service to anybody working in Trans Zero. And after several weeks of talking with them, uh, I got better. And one of the things that they said, suggested, they said, take notes, you know, write, write everything down, which I did. And after a few years, I started actually organizing those notes with photographs and you know, memories. And uh, the book actually was, was born out of that. You know, it wasn't, it's, it, it's a necessary thing. I had to write it to write myself out of the, out of the depression and, and bad feelings that I had. And one thing is that actually this is what I did through writing. And on the book, you see the back of uh, Tierna Cassidy, who I mentioned, he saved 13 people that first day. And he had a survival guilt because five of his brothers, whose names are actually tattooed here on, on his back, uh, they died there uh, in the first and second tower, some in the Marriott Hotel. And um, he dealt with it by one year spending in a tattoo parlor and having this beautiful picture tattooed on his back. So this was a different way of dealing with, uh, uh, with some of the feelings. If I answered your question. I know that this is um, a book which has come out both in Czech and in English. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us what, what came first and, and how that happened? Well, first came the, uh, the English version book. Uh, this was around 2010, 2011. I thought that for the tenth anniversary, I could mark it by, by having the book. Uh, but then actually some Czech publishing houses uh, you know, interest, were interested and they said we want it to be published in Czech. So very quickly I had to <laughs> translate it to Czech language. So the first actually book that came out was the Czech version. Which I have somewhere not here. And... Um, the English did not come out at that time, but now for the 20th, century, uh, 20th anniversary, I published the English, the Czech redacted as a redacted version, and also the English book as an audiobook. So it's available on, uh, on uh, Google Play, I believe. And now I'm fighting with Amazon because they say that it has too many decibels and so it's going to take a few more days, but it's going to be available also on Audible by Amazon. Maybe I'll just mention one thing is that uh, the drawings led to the creation of the models and the models first, the chipboard model led to the computer models. And uh, that was something that I feel was of great help when uh, sorting through the debris and, and pinpointing and focusing on some of the areas where still in the first two weeks we hoped that we could find some survivors. Um, and that kind of um, interest in 3D modeling stayed with me till this day. Now I'm focusing on virtual reality and uh, art visualization through virtual reality of architectural projects. Okay. The next question that I've come across is, um, did the gas in the wings cause the tower to fall because of the weight of the gas? Uh, no, it was the volume. Uh, Richard Custard, who was a specialist engineer from Arab Fire, uh, it was an engineering firm that was invited to, uh, to assess how the fire affected the structure, the integrity of the columns and beams, girders. Richard said one third of the 10,000 gallons that were in the wings, one third got consumed by the fireball, by the explosion. One third got soaked up into, let's say, the next five floors, immediate vicinity of the interior of the tower. And a third third, by gravity, kind of trickled down, fell to the lower floors. And um, it was, let's say, the second part that was soaked up in the surrounding area of the impact area. Uh, was what uh, compromised the structural in integrity, the, the molecular 
structure of steel, right? Because it reached the yield point when steel is no longer, uh, doesn't have the property to carry a load. It turns into kind of jello, right? And start the, the molecules start being pulled apart, falling, you know, apart, not falling apart, pulled apart. And there were two, uh, two theories on how, uh, what was the first, um, uh, let's say the first moment which caused the uh, series of other failures, right? It was a um, progressive failure of those structures. Um, basically it was either the two bolts on each side of a, of a girder, no, I'm sorry, of a, of a beam, it was a beam, it was holding two bolts, uh, quarter, three quarter inch thick. They just snapped because, uh, you know, the beam was being elongated and it, there was a shear force like scissors. They snapped, cut these uh, bolts. And the minute you had the inner core detached from the exterior skin, this armor, all of a sudden the, the weight of the, this hat Right, which is above the impact area, it was pushing heavily down on these columns that didn't have the lateral bracing, and all of a sudden they buckled, right? And that's the moment when one floor gave in and started falling onto the floor below, and this impact area on that floor, which didn't expect that kind of force, it, it was prepared to hold some file cabinets and people and, but never something so sudden. So that led to that progressive collapse. You said these puffs of smoke, that's when it, one floor hit the second floor and it was continuing all the way down. It actually collapsed beautifully because it didn't cause any damage to other buildings, right? It didn't topple, it just kind of collapsed onto itself. and. The, the exterior skin, which was load-bearing skin, it unfolded like banana peels. It says, thank you for the slides and details. What 4D system did you use? It was a computer program, Maya, uh, which allows animation. Uh, we got together and formed a company, Brainstorm Computer Animated Solutions. And <clears throat> uh, most of the work, uh, was done by these um, wizards in computer animation. They actually came from the world of uh, entertainment because uh, if you remember in the 90s, it was very popular, these movies about a train that crashed or ship that sunk. And they, they were doing these uh, 50 minute, what was it like, you know, when it was just going down you know, to the bottom of the sea? And uh, so they had the perfect tools for it. And I and other engineers supplied them with the data and they applied the you know, skills of the animation. So we were hired later, actually in the spring of 2002 by the lawyers of Larry Silverstein, who was uh, leasing the WTC. Uh, it was Wachta, Lipton, Rosen and Katz. And uh, they used our model to actually show, not after the collapse, which already we had, but we had to rebuild, recreate the towers and then bring them down to show that when one tower collapsed, it did not damage the other one. It just kind of struck it, shaved it, skin. But if one of the planes never took off from the airport, there would still be one tower standing either south or north. And that was very critical because he tried to get out of the insurance companies two events, right? Money for two events, terrorist attacks. But they said, no, it's coordinated effort, it's one event. So there was a difference between three and a half billion dollars and seven billion, which you know he needed much more actually to rebuild the site. Uh, a question, are the photos, and I assume they, uh, the person means uh, the photos from your presentation today, are they all included in the book? Uh, yes, there are many photos in the book also, yes. Uh, why did the third building fall? Uh, the third building was the WTC7 to the north of uh, the 
to two towers. What happened? This is very interesting. The building was built uh, in the 80s, maybe 81, uh, on a footprint which didn't really, it wasn't supposed to be a tall building because underneath the footprint of this tower were running cables to the next door building, the Verizon building, right? And uh, the Verizon building was a major communications uh, uh, institution in, in Manhattan. And when they built WTC7, they could go only one floor down. They had only one cellar. That building, though, was 47 story high. And it had FBI and uh, even in the summer of 2001, the bunker was established in this building on the 25th floor, right? Uh, and bunker needed the power generator in case there's a blackout. You know, hospitals needed, courthouses needed, you know, prisons. So usually in these tall buildings, you put the uh, emergency generators and uh, and gasoline tanks on the roof or in a cellar, right? It has a double skin so that you know it's guarded against explosion. But in the WTC7, there was no cellar. So what they had to do, uh, the lobby was, I think, four story tall. They kind of bundled these additional uh, emergency generators you know, with fuel in fourth or fifth through eighth floor, right? So you had this beautiful lobby and elevator sheds, but on the exterior, or surrounding it in the center, you had these, uh, you know, <laughs> it was, uh, what would you call it? It's like uh, very combustible, dangerous containers, you know, with, with, with uh, combustible fluid. And when the North Star was collapsing, it hit the, uh, the skin of the WTC7. And like a match, it, it ignited these uh, tanks, gasoline tanks. So that's why the building was eaten from inside several hours. It was just working its way up and it folded onto itself and just collapsed because there was a tremendous heat from this burning, you know, everything was burning at this point, you know, even, even steel because there was an incredible heat. Uh, so it was not, uh, you know, some conspiracy theories are saying, you know, they somehow brought it down uh, you know, by themselves, FBI or whatever, you know, it was these really stupid decision uh, storage tanks. How did you uh, persuade police at the Brooklyn Bridge to take you to ground zero and then later on to, to let you have plans for the towers? Uh, there was no other way than they had to let us in. I, I didn't allow for <laughs> any other option. You just have to let us, you know, I actually, not only did they have to let it, the, us there, but I told them, you give us a, a, a van and you exp, uh, transport us there, right? Which they did very gladly. And the, the next day, getting the plans? Uh, the plans also, um, they had only one set of plans. And I said, I have to make uh, copies. You have to allow me to do that. So finally, after like five times, I was arguing with them, they said, okay, we're gonna give you one of our police department, KPD people, William Burns, I remember his name. He was from somewhere like on in, in Jersey. And um, we went to uh, Turner Construction. And also I was, I don't have much hair now, but I was very handsome. <laughs> and uh, maybe that also uh, played a role. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Um, uh, another question sort of about the, the engineering of the collapse. Uh, I've heard that the initial impact of the crash knocked the fireproofing off the metal and the fire weakened the metal beams. Is that a viable theory? Absolutely. That was one of the, um, uh, one of the main, uh, let's say, aspects that contributed to the weakening of the, of the steel because the, the impact, it just like, like when you blow onto a cake, when you're blowing out a candle, you know, the, the foam 
basically was knocked off the the fireproofing uh, was knocked off the steel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Here's the mask question: Were you wearing a mask, and how many days were you exposed to air at Ground Zero? Have you had health issues besides, obviously, the mental health issues? Uh, I. Yes, the first day we, as soon as we stepped out of the police van, there was, uh, they were uh, National Guard people and they gave us these paper masks. They were kind of laughable, right? Paper masks, uh, they didn't do anything. Also, I had a facial hair. So when you have facial hair, you really, <laughs> any mask is almost pointless because, you know, the air gets in. But uh, I did wear it uh, not as often, not only myself, we didn't care really about our health at that time. And uh, I luckily, I have to knock on wood, I um, have good health, uh, good lungs. Uh, I'm every year I'm checked by the World Trade Center Health Registry. So uh, I was lucky, yes. I think it was the full question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, God forbid this were ever to happen again. Are current designs for tall buildings fundamentally different to how uh, World Trade Center was uh, designed and built? Yes. Uh, many guidelines were put in place uh, after 9-11 and uh, New York City Building Department, uh, uh, at least 10 of them I, I am aware of, of. You could not have progressive collapse because every 10th floor is um, uh, enforced in its, um, uh, let's say, it's strengthened every 10th floor. So the collapse could stop at that floor and wouldn't continue all the way down. Uh, second is that you can't enclose uh, escape or egress routes, right? That's uh, through which you are evacuating in a stairwells by two layers of, of uh, sheetrock, right? Uh, that's no longer viable, you, you have to actually put it into a tube, uh, reinforced concrete tube. So that way you are actually safe when you're evacuating. Anything could happen around you, but inside that tube, you are safe. Uh, sprinkler systems, um, fireproofing is very much now controlled and, and uh, checked. And also the exterior skin of the building, uh, the first, let's say, 40 floors are strengthened. So either truck that would try to uh, attack the building from the street level wouldn't do anything. I'm talking actually here about the World Trade Center 1, the new tower. But all these things are now mandated on other tall buildings. We may have gotten through all the questions in the chat. In addition, there are many comments. Um, uh, <laughs> grateful um, and very personal. And I, I can't read them because I'll just cry. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I think it's, um, you know, uh, I, I think you reached a lot of people. A lot of people really appreciated um, your perspective, uh, the insight that you were able to give uh, that's been unlike a lot of uh, uh, the other reporting that we've had on the occasion of this, this anniversary. Um, I just wanna see if there's anyone who's been trying to uh, get a question across by raising a hand. I, I, I saw one question uh, where uh, it said, everybody would run away, why did you run in? Ah, I'm um, sorry. good question. And, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how to answer it because it wasn't conscious. Uh, as I said, you at that moment you act on a different, you know, it's some autopilot or something. So uh, I'm the type of person who doesn't run away. There are others who run away and they save their life. I probably would not do so well in in uh, Ice Age, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's just personality. I don't know how to explain it. Hey. Oh, oh, how does one order the book? That's a good question. Uh, yes, uh, the book is, um, uh, I have uh, many copies here in my house and I have <laughs> to get them somehow to the US, the physical ones. I'm actually, please, I'm looking for a literary agent. If you know anybody, that would be a great help. Uh, if somebody would actually take the time and read the book and say, look, this is uh, worthwhile publishing, that's something that uh, would make me happy. 
because uh, it's um, it's basically a self-published book, the English version. The audiobook is available on um, Google Play and hopefully soon will be available on Amazon. But the actual physical paperback, uh, I would be happy to find a literary agent in the US and have the book published there. So it's my one wish and, and uh, I'm sending it out to you. Okay, well, hopefully someone in our audience can uh, have the right connections to help you out with that. They must. Look, in New York, you yeah. know everybody, you know, it's like <laughs> two degree separation. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, anyone else on my team spot a question I missed? Anyone else in the audience want to chime in? I think there is one more. Did your experience in 1968 help you deal with this event? Uh -huh. In... Uh, Oh, you mean uh, the Russian right. invasion? Yeah, it seems what they refer to. Uh, I wasn't born then, but uh, I'm, I'm 1970. <laughs> I'm a little younger, but uh, yes. Um, see, my grandparents were uh, in jail, right, by the communists. We escaped uh, Czechoslovakia in 87. And I've had always uh, trouble with... Uh, with um, totalitarian system or some kind of a nonsense that was either communist or before then it was the Nazis. And um, so I'm a little bit of a loose cannon in a good sense, I should say. <laughs> um, and yes, that, that helped, yeah. Um, if somebody tells me that I should do something or should not do, and if that's an idiotic you know, command or request, I don't do it. Okay. Well, Yuji, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, you know, as so many of our, our audience members have said, it, it, it gave a unique perspective on, you know, a day that we're all still kind of processing and, and thinking back on very much today. Um, it, it's a pleasure to have you join us here uh, for SFEU New York. Uh, we hope, um, you know, that we'll see you uh, again in New York soon. <laughs> um, and again, uh, uh, to our audience, thank you for joining us for this uh, for this presentation. And do please mark your calendar for the thirtieth for our next uh, our next presentation with Martin Holup. Uh, and we look forward to to seeing you uh, often uh, uh, this fall. Wonderful. Uh, one one uh, little comment: I'm coming to New York uh, at the end of uh, October. Mm. So if that's something that um, sounds interesting, we could maybe do a you know in face uh, meeting oh. or a talk or or oh, nice. connect you with your new literary agent perhaps stay with us bye thank you 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 thank you